Good morning, everyone. Please take your seats. We're getting ready to start. And what's running right now is a video that uh, is a promotional video, actually, about the DODEA training, Department of Defense Education Activity training that we just developed. That talks about training educators and school staff to know that trafficking is a problem in some of our schools in DOD. So. suspicion in itself um, is enough to be able to take action and I need to reach out to law I recognize that I am the last line of defense maybe the only line it's a tremendous responsibility thank you and now we're going to have Mr. Booth who is the Director of Human Resources Activity, um, come and talk and introduce our speaker who, who is going to be opening our remarks for the, our guest speakers. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring on Mr. Booth. Well, good morning. Thanks for being here. Hello. Good morning. Keep, keep, on, keep on coming in. Uh, now, I, I do realize we have a, a little bit of a problem to go because if we in defense don't realize this, but part of the federal government is shut down. And because of that, some of our outside partners, especially places like the State Department, are, are not being able to be with us this morning. But we're glad we're here. Now, I have a distinct honor this morning. I get to introduce my boss, the uh, Honorable James M. Stewart, who is the performing the duties of the USC PNR. He also happens to be the ASD for MNRA. I've known Mr. Stewart, I've known him as General Stewart for a long time. Uh, I want to tell you he's a man of all seasons. He started out as a dependent, a military dependent in the military family, uh, going to bases everywhere. Then he went to, graduated from Auburn, a proud war eagle, uh, went on to uh, pilot training, uh, flew at AMC, or Old Military Airlift Command, uh, which put him going around the world. And if you're going around the world, things that we have to deal with, deal with on something like combating, you know, trafficking in people, you're there, you see it. Not just in the, here, but around the world. Um, spent about 14 years on active duty, spent 22 plus years in the reserve business, never quit serving. And I gotta tell you, just a good person that cares about people. I'm not going to take any more of his time and just have him to come on, General Stewart, or Mr. Stewart, Honorable James Stewart. I'm limited to the podium, which is something that I dislike immensely. I like to wander around, and they said that you have to go ahead and stay behind the podium, which is uh, just as well, because I did have some prepared remarks. I don't normally uh, do that. But I wanted to make sure that I stress certain items associated with this very, very important program. And so bear with me, uh, because I'm going to go ahead and put my glasses on, which yesterday, whenever I was over here, I forgot. So I'm going to go ahead and use them today as I uh, set this up. Now, today is a very important day. I want to thank Bill for the introduction. And I also want to thank Ms. Dixon and her folks for basically taking the time to moderate uh, this event, and to our guests that are here today, they're going to talk to you a little bit after I do about the issue of human trafficking. Uh, many of you might know this, but some may not, that this month, January, has been proclaimed by the President as National Slavery and Human Trafficking Month. Trafficking Prevention Month. We make sure we understand that preventing this. And so ultimately, it's very, very important that we discuss this topic. Combating trafficking in persons is a responsibility 
that the Department of Defense takes very, very seriously. Human trafficking not only destroys the lives of those victimized, but really importantly as well, and really equally important, is it destroys families that are out there. And it poses a direct threat for the security and well-being of the entire world. As we'll hear from our speakers today, the Department of Defense community is not immune from trafficking issues. In my position as performing the duties of the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, I'm committed to ensuring that the Department of Defense continues to take an aggressive stance against trafficking and the related activities that may contribute to it. Going forward, the Department of Defense will continue to partner with external agencies and within our own components to raise awareness and to ensure our total force understands their role in preventing, recognizing, and most importantly, reporting trafficking in persons incidents. Now, I remember this, as Bill mentioned, I was in uniform for a time, and I remember when this program first started in 2005. I was trained, and I wondered why in the world am I getting this training? But as I received the training, I understood the impact, especially traveling overseas and seeing weird situations that I would see out there, individuals that really looked like they needed some help. And so DOD continues to invest in and develop a variety of robust training exercises and resources to help educate our total force on combating trafficking in persons. In 2018, the Department of Defense launched a new specialized training for our DOD education activity school personnel. I think that was the video that you just looked at there was associated with that. We have specialized training for our investigative and acquisition professionals, and we have toolkits out there for our leaders, which I'm very, very familiar with as a commander whenever I was serving. We had a toolkit out there that basically provided us information on how to do that. And then we have our own specialized training in various areas. Today you'll hear examples of trafficking cases involving, involving DOD personnel as both victims and as perpetrators. Now, I want to thank our guests in advance our federal partners for being here, for helping DOD build its anti-trafficking program, both domestically and internationally, with coalitions that benefit our military mission. Now, as the President has said in his 2019 proclamation, modern slavery in all its manifestations is a blight on humanity and an affront to our fundamental values. We will not rest until we eradicate this evil. The Department of Defense is the defender and protector of the people around the world. We will strive to abolish trafficking through prevention and ending demand for slaves. I want to thank you for taking your time to be here, and I know you have very busy schedules, but I really want to make sure that you are here and understand uh, the importance of this subject matter and that you learn more about combating human trafficking. Now, Ms. Dixon, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I thank you, and you're going to introduce our guest today. So, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I just want to welcome everybody and thank you all for coming. We have three speakers, and at the end of those speeches, you can ask questions, but let us get through, for the sake of time, each of the speakers. Our first speaker, Helene Lani Grant, she's from the Department of Attorney General's Missing Child Center in Hawaii. She's going to talk about the realities of human trafficking from a survivor's perspective. When she concludes her, her speech, we will have Lieutenant Dave Lane, he's a staff judge advocate for the Naval Criminal Investigative Services Executive Assistant Director of Atlantic Operations and Special Assistance to the United States Attorney, Eastern District of Virginia. And then our last speaker is Senior Airman Josephina Sabori. She's a chaplain's assistant in the Air Force at Arizona Air National Guard, 162nd Wing, Combat and Trafficking in Persons Program Manager, and she's a former detective 
with the Pima County Sheriff's Department in Arizona. She's going to talk about the human trafficking training systems and an overview for the Department of Defense communities. So please join me in welcoming our guest speakers. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you for having us. It's an honor to be here. Today, I'd like to share my experience, um, not only for the sake of sharing the story, but to inform, equip, and provide insight for the, on the issue of sex trafficking, also known as modern day slavery. My hope is that you will be enraged that it will ignite to act, and so that you will act and bring change. There is something everyone can do, and some things only one can do, but together we can make a difference. Today I stand proxy on behalf of the many survivors across the globe, those that have gone before us and was not able to survive, and those that have not discovered that they have a voice. As I share, I ask that you take a moment to think of your dearest family members, your daughter, your son, your niece, your nephew, your, your cousins. If this were them, what would you do? There is something everyone can do, and some things only one can do, but together we can make a difference. At the age of 25, as a newly divorced military spouse, I got into the social scene where I met a man in a nightclub. We dated for two weeks where he got to know everything about me, where I lived, where my daughter went to preschool, where my family lived, where I worked. I had a college degree. I had a career. At the end of those two weeks, he drove me to what they call a track, where he had many girls and women that he had working for him. He told me, this is the, the truth. I am a pimp. I own an escort agency. And this is what you will do for me. I, of course, quickly disagreed, but then he proceeded to get out of the vehicle and violently beat every single female that was out there until they were covered in blood to display that he will do what he told me he will do. He will kill me if I don't do what he said. He will kill my daughter if I tell the police. He will kill my grandmother if I don't do exactly what he says. Those two weeks turned into two years of my life. I was exploited. I was exploited on several websites such as Backpage, Craigslist, Redbook, and also newspaper advertisements that were advertised as central massages. During this time, the largest clientele was military personnel. I was from a state, the state of Hawaii, that's known as truly paradise, clearly a place where dehumanization would not exist. The state of Hawaii is also a place where every, every branch of service is represented. We have large events, such as the Pro Bowl that would take place from time to time. We also have the Super Bowl known nationwide. We also have events such as RIMPAC, which a lot of you are familiar with. These large events bring traffickers, bring girls and, and women and also boys from all over the world around because there are boatloads of military personnel that come 
and are looking to purchase sex. <clears throat> there is something everyone can do, but some things only one can do, but together we can make a difference. During those two years, we would be driven nearby several bases, military bases, on and around bases, to bars where the pimps would watch us and we were told to look for the drunk ones, look for the military soldiers that are drunk. They're the easy ones. We then proceeded to go on base and transactions would happen in barracks, in homes, on military bases, in warehouses, while these military personnel is on duty and off duty, in military personnel vehicles, in personal vehicles, while people are, soldiers, military personnel are on duty and other soldiers see what's going on and they clearly turn turn their eye and look the other direction. This continued on for two years. Every single day I fought. I fought with everything inside of me to get away from this man because I did not want this life. I wanted to be a mother to my daughter. I wanted to be a woman to bring change, a woman that continued to, to thrive in her career and live as a human being should. Such as large events, I, it wasn't until the Miami Super Bowl of 2010 is where I was, be, I was able to be rescued from the life of sex trafficking. Every single day for two years as I fought to get away from this pimp, I, there were things done to me, such as Timmy, where the pimp would put on his Timberland boots and stomp, stomp, stomp on us, fiercely, violently, just because, to inflict fear, because he wasn't walking with me every step of the way, but these are the invisible chains that kept me in bondage and kept me fearful that if I told someone he's going to kill me, there's no way I can get away from this man. So it came to 2010 Super Bowl. I was in Miami, a tip was put in, and there was an undercover operation. That is where the pimp was detained, and I was able to be questioned and eventually return back to Hawaii. This is where um, eventually, and this made headlines, this is where eventually, eventually this pimp was convicted and sentenced to 22 years in federal prison. Of the girls and women that he transported to Miami, it was myself, another adult female, and a 15-year-old girl. During this time, I didn't know where to start, I didn't know where to begin, but I knew and I vowed that I'm committing my life to ensure that every survivor from that day on is going to have help and I dedicated my life thereafter to ensure that everything I wish I had, everything I wish that was, I, every service that I wish was available to me, we're gonna fight, we're gonna fight with you. And, and that's where, what I've been able to accomplish to this day. Today, I can only share the critical details of my life journey to help bring change to the course of those victims yet to come. Today, a lot of you can only do certain things in your line of work and position. So I encourage you that there is something everyone can do and some things only one can do, but together we can make a difference. One last story I'd like to share I had the honor of mentoring a 15-year-old girl dependent. Her mother was in the military. 
she lived on a unsecured base and she would walk every day to school. This unsecured base is where pimps would target and go every day to look specifically for girls just like her. As she was walking one day, this pimp came across of her and told her she was beautiful, told her that, you know, you could do great things and spent time with her. Soon after, she ran away from home. She ran away from, for one night. Her mother was distraught. This girl was a straight A student. Uh, her mother was a soldier and a single mother. And she was, at the time, engaged, ready to get remarried. Um, this young girl was gone overnight um, and then returned the very next day. Her mother said, where did you go? She said, well, I have a boyfriend and he loves me. He told me that we're going to do great things together and I'm beautiful. And soon after, she ran away again and she was gone for two weeks. During that time, her mom would call me and we'd work together and she had no assistance from law enforcement. You know, it was hard for her to get that support that she needed, but we worked together to find out that this young girl, 15 years old, she was soon put up on international escort agency websites. She was being exploited on, on websites such as Backpage, Craigslist. She was being sold. Her mother found a book in her, in her room with times and prices, um, prices 3 p.m. for $600, 2 p.m. for $200. So we put all these pieces together to, to then find out that this girl was being solicited and this boyfriend was not a boyfriend, but her pimp. During this time of two weeks, he, um, she, got gang, she was gang raped constantly. Men came in and out of this room, used her for sex, and the pimp took all of this money for his gain. She was posted on several websites, um, a lot of nude uh, photos and also videos um, of her was posted online. During this time, her mother would call me and say that this blocked number would call her. And she could hear someone breathing and she knew that was her daughter. She said, Kalei, I know that's my baby. I can hear her breathing. No one will help me, what can we do? Eventually, eventually we worked with law enforcement to set up an undercover sting operation where this young girl was driven to the hotel by her pimp. This is where she was able to go to the hotel into safety. The pimp was then apprehended. We were then able to reunite her with her mother. We then found out that this young girl contracted many STDs. She was pregnant where she shortly after had a miscarriage. She was beaten head to toe, bruises everywhere. Once they arrested the pimp, they go through a process as well. Um, he, he also tested positive for many STDs, one of which um, he tested positive for HIV. Fortunately, thankfully, this young girl did not contract HIV. The point of this story is sex trafficking happens everywhere. And what does it look like? It looks like this. Who are the victims? It looks like your daughter, your son, your cousin. It looks ordinary. Pimps don't look out of the ordinary. They look like the man that sits at Starbucks. They look like the man that sits outside of the door at the NEX, targeting our young girls and boys and women. And we need to be prepared. We need to be ready because as much as we do our career and be prepared to, to do our line of work, these traffickers do the same because they see this as their business. So we need to be 10 steps ahead of them to be prepared to protect our children. 
So I share my story, I share the story on this young girl's life to just give you insight on what's really happening out there. It's really not about what you see in the movies. It's about ordinary people that not necessarily are we from you know, bad backgrounds or a certain state or a certain country. It can happen to people from wealthy communities, people in the military, dependents of military personnel. So the need for training is absolutely necessary. And, you know, I just want to thank all of you for taking the time for listening to me and to us, our presentation today. But most of all, as military personnel, thank you for your service and thank you for looking out for the victims that are out there. And I, and I thank you for being the change that we need in this world. So thank you very much. challenges that not only military prosecutors face, but also civilian prosecutors. Because at the end of the day, a prosecution in the military under the UCMJ or under Title 18 is going to look very similar, especially these days with the new Military Justice Act 2016 being implemented, um, and the challenges for prosecutors are going to be largely the same. So sort of what is human trafficking, um, both legally and sort of colloquially, it's all about that compulsion or coercing someone to work or to engage in forced labor or, or a sex act, um, a commercial sex act. That is the thrust of this offense, um, not only legally, but as we think of sex trafficking specifically, it's all about compulsion and coercion. And that makes it a largely psychological uh, offense as well, which is part of what we'll talk about. So where does human trafficking occur? We just have an easy list here. Um, cases all over the country and all over the world have emanated out of all these different types of institutions. Um, of note for the community watching this presentation, um, on military installations, as we just heard, um, and maybe more importantly and broadly, in the communities in which our military serves, both at home and abroad. All right, so we'll jump into the statutory tools here. We're gonna talk a little bit about both Title 18, um, which is our civilian uh, criminal system, but as well as uh, Title 10, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. All right, sex trafficking under 18 U.S.C. 1591. Um, this is just the elements so that everyone can sort of get a broad overview of what investigators need to identify to prosecute these cases, and of course what prosecutors need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, there has to be an interstate commerce nexus, which is pretty easy to establish, as we just heard. A lot about this crime has to do with the internet these days, and from that is uh, an easy way for us to establish an interstate commerce nexus for this uh, offense. Um, again, with regards to sex trafficking, we're talking about recruiting, um, enticing, um, for purposes of engaging in a commercial sex act. Um, and again, that final element there, by means of force, threats of force, fraud or coercion for adult victims, or if a victim is under 18 uh, years of age, then we kind of have a, 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 a pro se violation or a, 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 an immediate violation um, where you don't have to establish that, that last element there. Again, that's just if they're under 18. 
you're good to go. Um, but again, looking at that final element, I think it's important for us to understand how there's a psychology involved um, in those words there, fraud or coercion, and uh, that's where an emphasis needs to be in terms of law enforcement training and training for prosecutors as well. There are other tools as well, um, not in a legal sense, they're lesser included offenses, but I think colloquially, colloquially speaking, it's important for us to understand that there are other attendant crimes that go along with sex trafficking. Obviously, prostitution is a big one, but also the drug trade are crimes that we will also see um, associated with human trafficking and sex trafficking. That interstate nexus, we talked a little bit about that. Um, the last uh, way to prove this element of the crime is probably the most important these days and surely will be going forward. Um, and that's the use of the internet. We heard a little bit about back, back page. Craigslist, we see a lot of kick messenger and third party messenger applications being used by military personnel and civilians um, to engage in uh, prostitution related behavior and human trafficking. All right, force, fraud, and coercion. Um, again, just to give sort of a 30,000 foot view of what this is about so that we can again understand how it's a psychological crime uh, more than anything else. It's important to know that it's, it's also a very broad um, element of this crime. It can be proven in myriad different ways. Um, actual or threatened serious harm, use of bodily harm for another person, abuse of legal process or threats against psychological threats um, from which perpetrators can exploit victims. A little more detail here on coercion. Um, again, it can be physical or non-physical. Again, psychology is paramount in, in this type of uh, crime, and what prosecutors and law enforcement are going to be doing is looking at the totality of the circumstances when they're investigating a case um, from beginning to end to sort of establish how the coercion took place. Um, and again, this, this, we need to understand how this is a victim-centric crime. We need to be investigating these crimes as law enforcement and as prosecutors from a victim standpoint, understanding that psychology and understanding that um, Coercion is a difficult thing to prove. We can prove it in a lot of different ways, um, but it really it involves us um, understanding how victims respond to trauma um, in order to prove this element beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, we mentioned how minor victims, um, it can be a little bit easier to prove when they're involved. Um, do we have to prove that a perpetrator knew the actual age of their victim? Not necessarily. If they had a reasonable opportunity to observe the victim, again, looking at the totality of the circumstances, um, there's not really a need to prove actual knowledge of, of the underage nature uh, of that victim. Big takeaway here from that Title 18 statute that we've just been looking at, there's a lot of broad liability for this, but again, we have to understand the nature of victims, the people we're dealing with. Um, we'll talk about challenges in a couple minutes here uh, that prosecutors face with dealing with, with victims of this type of trauma, um, but it's a broad statute. Uh, there's a lot of ways to prove it, but we have to understand uh, the nature of the crime we're investigating, um, aside from just sort of the one-off, is it a prostitution investigation or is it a drug investigation? We have to understand that human trafficking is part and parcel to all of that um, around the world. <coughs> just an overview of the penalties that perpetrators face if convicted of sex trafficking. Pretty easy here, of course, sex offender registration is on the table, uh, supervised release, um, forfeiture of assets, and we'll talk about UCMJ in a couple minutes, but uh, uh, what's important to note here is that some of these uh, penalties are not available to the military prosecutor. Of course, the military prosecutor is not going to have an opportunity to leverage a mandatory minimum over a defendant, uh, nor are we going to be able to keep sort of uh, tabs on a perpetrator through the use of supervised release. Um, asset forfeiture is not something that's available to the UCMJ uh, prosecutor. Um, so close coordination is needed with the Department of Justice in a lot of these cases to uh, assess what the best prosecutorial venue actually is in a given case. Just a quick note on forced labor. Um, the emphasis of this presentation is on sex trafficking, of course, but forced labor is a problem in the military. As the folks in this room know, um, it is something that we encounter around the world, in war zones even. Um, we need to do as much as we can to ensure that our, our, our contractual uh, means that we're using uh, to, to outsource um, various things in war zones and around the world, um, that we are complying with the laws that govern uh, forced labor and human trafficking in this sense, um, and understanding the people that we're contracting with, because at the end of the day, where we see this most often in terms of forced labor is not with the primary person with whom we're contracting as a department, 
but with third party contractors, subcontractors um, that maybe we don't have as much situational awareness on. All right, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. We'll talk about uh, what's available to the military prosecutor specifically. Um, right now, the only way to prosecute the human trafficking specifically is through the vehicle of the general article, Article 134 of the UCMJ. Um, the way we do that is not because we have an enumerated 134 offense in the military, but we have to incorporate the Title 18 statutes that we've just uh, run through. Um, that provides some challenges that we'll talk about in just a couple minutes here. Um, but the only sort of sex trafficking related offense that is enumerated right now under the UCMJ is patronizing a, prostit a prostitute. And of course that's a, 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 big, uh, a big issue around the world for, for our sailors, marines, soldiers, and airmen. Um, but if we don't have a dedicated statute under the UCMJ, one might understand how it, it, it can become problematic if we're trying to investigate and address this uh, in a holistic sense and understanding that um, patronizing prostitution uh, drug offenses are part and parcel to something a lot larger in the sense of human trafficking. Investigating these cases I think is going to become a lot easier for law and military law enforcement uh, going forward through the implementation of the new Military Justice Act 2016. There's a lot more uh, pre-referral of charges and investigative measures that can be taken by um, the various military law enforcement agencies. Uh, we now have subpoena power pre-referral of charges so in the investigation now our, our military investigators can, can leverage subpoenas, um, search warrants for internet related materials and communications, which as we talk about how important the internet is to the perpetration of this crime, um, that's going to be enormously helpful. No longer will it be the case that we necessarily have to go over to our DOJ counterparts, the local US Attorney's Office, um, to, to uh, easily investigate these cases. All right, some challenges in the prosecution of these offenses. Again, largely these are the same challenges that, and issues that civilian prosecutors face. Victims who fear reprisal, locating victims and making them comfortable with coming forward and cooperating from an investigation all the way through a sentencing. Um, a lot of times we're dealing with sophisticated criminal uh, enterprises and networks, and all these factors make it difficult um, for civilian prosecutors, civilian law enforcement, as well as for military prosecutors and military law enforcement. Um, and again, the challenges associated with not having a dedicated statute in the UCMJ um, for human trafficking specifically, um, one might understand how that being the case, if we're identifying these as a, a one-off prostitution offense, our prosecutors, our military law enforcement just aren't exposed all that much to um, the broader set of crimes that are associated as human trafficking. Um, that being the case, I think, of course, education is, is key. I think we're doing a much better job now with uh, helping our law enforcement understand that um, taking it from the mindset of the one-off prostitution prosecution uh, to something bigger and identifying when we have a victim in that sense, when we have perpetrators in that sense, it's probably some, part of something larger um, that needs to be addressed from the standpoint of human trafficking um, and a bigger charge than sort of the run of the mill prostitution prosecutions that we see more frequently. Cultural considerations. This is a big one. A lot of times when we're seeing these offenses, they are overseas. They are in war zones. They're in places um, where the cultures are different. And, it, and it's, it comes back to the psychology of the victim. A lot of times we're encountering victims who don't understand that they are in fact a victim of human trafficking, of forced labor. Um, and that's a big thing for our law enforcement and prosecutors to understand. Uh, not only do, will a victim fear reprisal, uh, fear for their safety coming forward, but in a cultural sense, they may not believe that they are the victim of something as sinister as human trafficking. And just some broad takeaways here, as we've been talking about, addressing human trafficking requires us to view it from sort of a systemic, uh, as a broad issue involving military installations and perhaps more importantly, the communities in which our military operates. Um, it's the surrounding neighborhoods, it's, um, and it's the fact of the matter that service members oftentimes are contributing to the demand in some of these areas around the world for uh, sex trafficking specifically. Um, prosecutors, especially in the military, have some tools um, to address these unique challenges, but probably not enough, and I think it's important that we continue to educate not just our broad DOD community, but prosecutors and law enforcement specifically to identify when they might be presented with a human trafficking situation and human trafficking victims. 
Prosecution specifically for human trafficking also only goes so far. We need to instill in our commanders, I think, uh, an understanding of what goes into human trafficking, what goes into sex trafficking, um, forced labor, and how these offenses impact uh, our military readiness. And I think part of that is stricter compliance with understanding off-base uh, locations and what, where, our, where our military community is operating, understanding what's around that installation and where our sailors, airmen, uh, soldiers, and Marines um, should not be going, and really putting some teeth on those things um, when we know that sailors are viol violating those rules, um, not just sort of brushing them off as sort of a lower level offense, but understanding that those lower level offenses are really contributing to something, something much more larger and more sinister, um, broadly speaking. Also important is interagency cooperation. Of course, especially overseas with the military, this is something that's not going to be solved only in the Department of Defense. Uh, we need close cooperation with our Department of State counterparts, Department of Justice, so that we're truly leveraging all the resources we possibly can to combat this um, from a military standpoint. That's all I have on the legal uh, aspect of, of this offense. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our final presenter, I think. Um, thank you all. We'll be happy to answer some questions uh, going forward. Okay, next, our last speaker, we have Senior Airman Josefina Sabori. Uh, she's here from uh, the Arizona Air National Guard. So welcome, uh, Sabrina. Good afternoon. She's getting this PowerPoint up. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. How does a senior airman get to come up here and talk, right? Uh, well, it's staff sergeant now. So um, I've been a single parent of four children that I raised. My oldest is 30 and my youngest is 22, two serving, one in uh, Africa deployed right now. So um, during the time I became a police officer, I got very good at it with investigations. And prior before law enforcement, I always did outreach with runaways. So I was studying human trafficking years ago and when I became a law enforcement officer, I saw the problem with the kids running away and they weren't being interviewed. So when I became a law enforcement and a single parent of four kids, I also took on a house of 10 teenage girls that were all victims of human trafficking and sex abuse. Is that working? Okay. Um, so I, for the past seven years, I've had a house of 10 teenage girls. I should have more gray hair, I know. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's a tough, it's really tough when we're so strict in the household. And I was sharing last night, I was the crazy mom. When kids came over, I needed to know who your parents were. I need to know where you live. I need your phone number for your parents. Short of blood samples, um, I wanted to make sure who was at my house. I'm just as strict at my foster house. They don't get to watch rated R movies. They don't get to um, go out by themselves. They're always being monitored. But unfortunately, we have technology nowadays. And for some reason, if you have kids in here, why do they have 500 friends in Facebook? Do they truly know who they are? So they're talking about this can happen to anyone. Last night, I shared my story. It happened in my house. So I have a 15-year-old victim. Um, she's been in the house the longest. Straight A students. She leads in prayer every dinner time. And when you, we get new girls in the house, she prays for those girls. She's the first kid in the house to get straight A's and make varsity soccer team. As I watched her um, play soccer the other day, she got hit really hard in the face and immediately triggered because she used to get beat up by her pimp. So that was on the soccer field. So uh, sometimes you have to let them get up and then you just cheer them on to keep going. So she pushed through it and then she's the first kid to uh, ever be adopted in the house in years. So this family was a firefighter and um, they were a good family. So they invited her to the house and said, you know what, you've never had anything. We're gonna give you your own bedroom set to pick out. You know what, you can wear whatever you want. Wait a minute, you never had a, your own computer? We're gonna give you a computer in your room and a cell phone. You can talk to anyone you want. 
there's dangers with technology that we, that we don't know about until we're trained. Thank you. So uh, with her case, um, Lorraine and grooming happens everywhere. Someone from the church reached out to her, became friends with her on Facebook, and started talking to her on Facebook Messenger. So when they did that, um, he told her, I want to support you with anything you want to do. You're the smartest kid ever. To, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of you. You know what, I want to give you whatever you need to help you. To, you look cute in that polka dot shirt, you should go put that on. So we caught the conversation, or the family caught the conversation, and didn't know how to deal with it and returned the girl to the house. So the, she's a smart girl, she's a good girl, never had any problems, but it can happen to anyone's kids. So that was a, that was a case that I just wanted to share until they got this up. So um, after years of serving as a police officer and working with victims uh, with foster home care, including my house, uh, I've always wanted to serve my country. Being older, I knew it was going to be tough, and I decided to join the military because I was already working with family readiness. So I joined the military. I rocked it at BMT. I went to the CrossFit Games. I was just rocking it everywhere. I had a world title in kickboxing as well. So there was nothing stopping me. So now I teach uh, self-defense to victims uh, that have been trafficked and sexually uh, abused. So. Now here I am, now I'm a staff sergeant, thank God, and I'm here presenting in front of you. So let's get going with this presentation. So trafficking in person, sex trafficking of women and children by its very nature is designed to be invisible, just like the example I gave you. This is gonna enable this criminal conduct to operate on both sides of the military gate. This is gonna affect civilians, military, and their communities. So up here are case examples, case examples that you're going to see a trafficker, you're going to see a victim, and you're going to see a John, a person that buys victims. All um, This was just in the news in Google. So the following are two case examples how victimization through trafficking impacts military and their dependents. The first case I have is a 19-year-old active duty member living on base was lured through a social media app. So... The trafficker made her promises and she fell into the life. So when she tried to get out of the life, the trafficker just started threatening her, I'm gonna go straight to your commander. And guess what, I'm gonna show those videos that I made of you. And I'm also gonna show those nude pictures. And she was back to work. Our next case example involves a 12 year old child dependent of an active duty military personnel. She was lured into the life on social media as well. The trafficker worked really good with this one because he utilized high school boys to help groom this girl into the life. So she was um, sold to military personnel for about five months. So these are just some examples how cases have no boundaries. I'm gonna talk to you about how we're gonna approach and combat, uh, combating trafficking by researching the problem, raising community awareness, training responders and investigators, and creating focus groups with subject matter experts. So National Criminal Training Justice Center has over 23 years of experience in providing problem-specific, research-based training and comprehensive training. So we've trained over 23,000 participants in just specialized training just from May 2017 to May 2018. Our training is to serve unique organizations to help solve the most pressing public safety needs. No one knows better than someone that has lived, lived the life to get out of the life and the functions of a trafficker. We, do, we utilize victims' voices to work with multidisciplinary teams and law enforcement. They assist with educating us with the victim-centered approach, and at times, they've even assisted with recovery of victims that are stuck in the life. Explaining coercion and control sometimes without any physical violence being involved, this is what victims can also help us. These survivors explain just those two basic elements, because not all trafficking involves physical violence. We see uh, big organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, they use victim impact voices and speeches, and we find that to be 
100% um, reliable with people and impact. So Amber Alert Training Technical Assistant Program and National Criminal Justice Training Center has a high RDO delivery system. We want to deliver training to meet every community and establishment. We know victims typically, typically are not going to self-report. So with research, we're able to deliver effective techniques and also technology involved related crimes. Most important, we can deliver effective interviewing techniques and aggressive prosecution for offenders. So let's break down this hierarchical process and each function. A focus group and an assessment. This is gonna evaluate for problem specific areas around your community. Community awareness. We assist with creating innovative programs, multidisciplinary teams, and how they work with you and your community. Training, technical related types of investigation, proactive responses, interview and interrogation specific for human trafficking. Let's talk about multidisciplinary teams, MDT. The importance that they have, they respond to trafficking involving people on and off bases. They work together with law enforcement and they work together well with our community. This is gonna help reduce demand no matter where it's at. We also utilize train the trainer because we want to provide long-term capabilities to sustain their efforts and keep them going. Focus group provide an opportunity <clears throat> to evaluate and leverage those resources between military and civilian organizations. And with an assessment, this is the biggest question I think we find is, do we have the problem in our area? How big is the problem? Who are the, who are the key players? Who are the Johns buying these victims? Who are the victims and who are the traffickers? So you can learn from an assessment, so you can use it to problem solve specific areas and identify specific training that is needed. <coughs> Conducting training for your communities to include service providers, the responders, and victim services. Research from ASU, these are our partners, of sex trafficking intervention. Once they, once they conducted training in a community, they were receiving reports daily. Law enforcement were able to identify the traffickers in their areas and even identify victims in their areas. Education of what victimology is really important because when we use the word prostitute, it becomes non-credible to our victims. So we do need to educate victimology so victims do not become non-credible by the word prostitution. So different types of cases. There's a difference when you discover a victim and when a victim discloses. When you discover a victim and you try to interview this victim, Typically, they're not gonna talk. You receive a report, we're gonna be reactive. But when a victim discloses, what do you do with the evidence when, when they tell you, we had a conversation on Kick or Snapchat, and this is where I went, or there was no money exchange, and you encounter, you encounter John and a victim, and you don't see any money on both of them, what do you do? And this is the training that we provide. So we know training has to be specific with human trafficking. They're unique victims, and their traffickers have challenging, uh, challenges as well. We know traditional techniques for investigations are not going to be successful with human trafficking victims. We also educate on search warrants. If you have a victim that's been traveled on and off base across county lines, possibly state lines, this is where it's gonna come, where it comes helpful so we can educate and also work with multidisciplinary teams. I actually had a case that involved all jurisdiction and the victim was found, she was tied up in a hotel room and she was able to break free and literally just educating one police officer um, to the family that was found. The victim was at Walmart the female that was trafficking her had a husband and two children, looked like a nice family. So when they, uh, the victim was trafficked, she ran away. They thought she was just drunk because they had induced her with substance abuse to get her to be compliant. Uh, she was at Walmart with her dad, saw her trafficker with her husband, and started freaking out. Police were called, 
All the police thought she was just a bratty kid that was went out and partied and was drinking. I trained one police officer uh, that arrived at that scene, and every police officer was screaming to let that family go. Their kids are hungry and they're tired. The one officer I trained actually said, just a second, went and talked to the trafficker and said, ma'am, we're gonna try to get you out of here as soon as possible. Let me have your number so I can give you a call here in a second. He found all the ads of the little girl on that page just by one person being trained. So we also do training for undercover operation like John Stings. This is where you put an ad and portray selling somebody or selling yourself. And this can work two ways. We've seen it where they set up an actual undercover operation at a hotel and uh, John will come by while well, thinking they're buying a victim and we take them down. The other way I've seen this work is in Tucson, when they have the phone number and they're calling the ad, there's police officers on the other end and they answer the phone and they say, yep, I'm detective so-and-so, I have your number, we know how to trace your phone call, I just want two minutes of your time to educate you about human trafficking. And they give them a little speech. Unfortunately, there's always one dumb one that keeps calling back. <laughs> So we post many ads, but it's good to know when you post many ads and they don't know it's the police or not, people are gonna be afraid to call in and look at, you know, talking to people. So let's talk about demand reduction. In addition to victim identification, suspect prosecution, and effective response, we must also have a demand reduction component, which can include, but not limited to, John civilian military, I'm sorry, joint civilian military operation to target those who purchase women and children for sex. So in, in Phoenix, they have John schools where they can be ordered to go to a school and be educated about human trafficking. So ASU study is showing one out of 20 men in their 20s is buying a victim. Um, supply, offer resource to victims as a victim-centered uh, approach. So just as technology provides greater opportunity for the perpetrator to identify and lure victims, it also provides civilian and military law enforcement the same leverage, same technology to identify the perpetrators and develop uh, corroborating evidence. The use of technology and social media is continuing to merge. Um, majority of the people I talk to typically have some type of social media. And this is how every social media app out there we have seen in a case. Snapchat, Tinder, Facebook, Instagram. And unfortunately, if your kids game online, it's now through gaming systems too. Yeah, go home and take away the Xboxes. So with National Criminal Justice Training Center, some agencies with our uh, training, some agencies reached out to us and said thank you. After we received your training, we could identify which ads were minors, which ads involved uh, trafficking, and that was just with some of our training. Training such as proactive investigation of child sex trafficking and online ads and the role of technology. So here are some courses that we offer. I, hopefully everyone got a copy of this PowerPoint. If not, I'm sure we'll make sure that you get it. So it's a big list and I know it's very small font. Um, Let's go over some of the takeaways. So we need a dedication addressing human trafficking issues. We need prosecution to be trained and also have some tools which can address human trafficking. We also need close coordination with DOJ to ensure civilians and perpetrators are being identified. So I didn't include labor trafficking, but that too is very important. But we, more important, we have to develop a culture where military members feel free and willing to come forward and report this type of behavior when they see it. I know we have uh, several programs in reference to drinking and driving and sexual assault. If we did such an impact with human trafficking, you're gonna see the same outcome. And after you receive an assessment and training, be prepared, it's out there. I haven't gone anywhere and presented um, that I didn't show them that there was human trafficking. They sent me to St. Pierre, South Dakota, out in the middle of nowhere. I was scared, being driven out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, here I'm thinking, Lord, they're supposed to have human trafficking out here? It's strange. 
So excuse my etiquette from the hunting verbiage, but they have some kind of big bird that they hunt out there. And all these fancy planes fly in with their private maids. So um, what I found out is they fly in all the girls during that hunting season. Trafficking occurs everywhere. There is no boundaries. And we need to educate within our community and also the schools. When we educate in schools, it's shocking how many kids come forward that are identified involved with human trafficking. And our traffickers look like any of us sitting in here. There is an important number. You might want to jot that down or take a picture. Um, so this is our information and our contact. We'll make sure everybody receives that. That's all I have for you. So thank you guys for your time. Okay. Thank you so much, Staff Sergeant uh, Sabarina. If anybody have any questions uh, for any of our speakers, uh, just raise your hand and if you have any questions. We got one right here. Hi, my question is for Lieutenant Lane. Um, so prior to coming to the DOD, I used to do research on human trafficking in Thailand. One thing I, I found out when I was there is labor trafficking is very prevalent in the products that they export out. So when it comes to the supply chain side of things, within the DOD, um, what is the DOD doing to try and mitigate human trafficking when it comes to doing product sourcing? And also, are you looking into new technologies, such as blockchain technology, in order to try and track these products and their slavery? So as a prosecutor, I'm probably not the, the best person to ask that question to in terms of what we're doing with our supply chain and chain in terms of technology improvements and things like that. Um, but I think there are statutory mechanisms in place contained within the law um, that require our contractors to meet certain requirements when it comes to how they're sourcing their products, um, how they're uh, implementing their labor, things like that. And as long as we're doing everything we can to comply with that law, um, I think we're generally in a pretty good position. The, the problem sometimes that we've identified um, in myriad cases is where we lose track of that process and who's responsible for whom when it comes to a, a contractor who is in compliance then subcontracting to foreign entities um, specifically. Uh, and, and then we kind of lose track of, of where we are in the process and, and who's complying with what. Um, that becomes the big issue from my perspective in the cases that I've witnessed. Um, so I think just making sure that throughout that chain, we are checking every single box and, and just making sure that we're as diligent as possible, that every level of that process is in compliance with the laws that are on the books. Um, I think that just goes an extremely long way to mitigating the impact. But I think you're absolutely right. I think thinking innovatively about this problem uh, comprehensively from beginning to end of the supply chain in the forced labor context. If there's technology that can improve that, can, imp can improve the, um, the integrity of that process, um, that's something that should be implemented or at least looked at. Please. <laughs> okay, so the State Department has what they call a supply chain resourcing tool. There's a tool that's it's available on the website that follows from throughout the supply chain of uh, how to look for, what to look for, and some examples of issues and cases uh, dealing with uh, forced labor trafficking primarily through the supply chain. So that is something that is available, and I do think we have a link to it on our website too. Uh, so at uh, ctip.defense.gov, if you go to our website and you type in um, resourcing tool, supply chain resourcing tool, there is a tool out there uh, to, to look for trafficking throughout the supply chain, okay? Any other questions? <laughs> no other questions? My question is involving all three sections of the game in the middle of the game. What one, and, and also psychological factors that traffickers use 
any one of you, what would be the number one cue that would tip off any of us um, to one of our family members, as a Facebook <coughs> user, or simply receiving general messages? What would be that one cue that would trigger a one for us? I would say the luring process, as Josie elaborated on, such as social media. If there's a conversation happening via messenger, whatever social media website, even in person that you see adult, a minor engaging in, um, I think that should be monitored because as she shared before her slideshow went up, uh, you know, someone wants to start luring someone, they're gonna try to establish trust and say things, such as the church member that she mentioned, because once that trust was established, she, he had this 15-year-old girl on FaceTime Messenger, and then spoke about, hey, why don't you put on that polka dot top? And then that's how you know nude photos are exchanged, and you know the button is pushed, and that's how pornography is done, and that's how it escalates to more and more. So I think, you know, because it's such a hard thing to gauge, because it looks like a relationship, it looks like maybe a boyfriend girlfriend type situation, but a lot of times it's not, you know, and I think. We just got to be aware for these types of flags um, to keep an eye out of those things. So really quick, I'm going to finish up on that from the investigative side. What I found with cases like that is there was an opportunity to report and they, did, they felt like, okay, if this is occurring, we would use case examples. I know we've had videos that we share with education where it shows um, Cindy, send Mark a picture, a new picture. Do you think this is a good idea, yes or no? And if it did happen, how do you report it to get help? So options so that they know where to go and report and to get help. Um, even though that behavior took place, what are the reporting options? What are the resources they can go to? And I'll chime in just a little bit on that um, to round it out a little bit. I think this is something that an area of the law where we can be a lot more proactive when it comes to investigations. Um, so much of this, at least in my experience as a prosecutor, is reacting to often times an anonymous tip or something like that where we don't have a whole lot to go on and we're trying to, uh, to take our investigation from there. And that's successful sometimes. But if you look at cases involving child exploitation, um, we have a lot of mechanisms in place where automatic triggers are in place for, for some of these technological mechanisms uh, where we'll get a, a hotline tip um, that will tell us exactly what was uploaded to a Dropbox account and we'll be able to easily implement, uh, for example, a child pornography investigation from that. And uh, we, we have proactive operations that address that issue. So I think doing similar things in this context, given the fact that technology is such an important piece of it, um, I, I think that's a possibility and going forward, I think everyone would be uh, well served by trying to take a more proactive view of this as opposed to uh, reactionary investigation, if that makes sense. Um, thank you all for uh, your, your remarks today. Um, it's particularly heart-wrenching to hear you talk about the active um, pieces, the transactional points of human trafficking. Um, to roll to the demand side, which I know we discussed a little bit here, um, I think that's where there's the cultural question um, for me about reducing demand, that how um, the mores, if you will, that make sexual assault also even acceptable in our culture, prostitution, purchasing sex, all of those things that as parents we look at our children and say, we just don't do that. My question, though, we spoke, speaks to um, the interagency and cross um, the enterprise cooperation. My perception is that the cultural mindset behind human trafficking is similar to that of just sexual assault of member on member or across the department within our own organization. To what degree are your organizations that are working on human trafficking collaborating with those in SAPRO? to change the cultural mindset of our department and those in our environment. 
So there are times that we do collaborate with sexual assault because there are some instances where it's, it's, it's both. And we've gotten cases where it, it looked like it was purely sexual assault, but then there was a human trafficking element. So yes, there are times that we definitely have to work with SAPRO uh, in, 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 in those particular cases. But there's a lot of distinct differences, you know, in this purely uh, human trafficking. Uh, does anybody else want to speak about sexual assault cases, maybe, uh, that you've ran across? So, yeah, during investigations, um, when we started, they were placing victims of sexual assault and victims of domestic violence and victims of uh, human trafficking together in the same shelter. They're completely different victims. If you're sitting down with a tr uh, victim that was trafficked as opposed to a victim of domestic violence, typically there's only one perpetrator. Uh, with a victim of human trafficking, there's several perpetrators in Johns, and typically there's more than one victim that's involved. Um, domestic violence victims, uh, typically it's the husband and wife, and there's one that's being extremely abusive. Uh, with a trafficker, typically they have a stable of girls, several girls, and they're all being physically abused to be compliant. So to sit down and have an understanding of a victim of uh, sexual assault or domestic violence, every victim is unique. Human trafficking victims are probably the most challenging because people are not trained how to interview them. And if you're not trained how to interview a victim of uh, sex trafficking, it's really hard to be successful with those interview techniques. And a trafficker, holy smokes, they are tough to interview but I guarantee you, they like to talk, but once again, you have to have training to identify each. And we have to talk about human trafficking, just as we did with sapper and sexual assault. We should be talking the same way about human trafficking so it does become normalized and people can report and come forward about it. So I guess my, my, my point was that I agree that transactionally, all those things are different, sexual assault, domestic violence, human trafficking, all very different for exactly the reasons yes. you said. But the underlying demand, mm -hmm. the cultural demand for sex at a price, whether that be free by just taking it or um, paying for it in a commercial appetite, that same mindset that that's okay is, is the same. And so the, the changing the cultural demand seems to be uniform across that. And that's where I see each one of these offices that's responsible for changing their particular transactional situation of, of sexual um, dis dysfunction, is, if I can even use that word, has that reason to change demand. And are you collaborating on changing the demand culture for it? That's where I see where there's cooperation or collaboration that can happen. Thank you for that. Um, I recall a time when domestic violence victims were not credible and their voices didn't mean anything, but look at how far we've come from them. And once we go into law enforcement agencies and we conducted training, the mindset started changing. But you also got to have a community aspect so that they understand how do you want your community to work with you for these types of issues. So we have to get education out there to everyone that's involved in order to change that mindset and offer resources. And quit using the word prostitution because it now makes the victim non-credible. But we gotta get the outreach out there, which is what we're doing, and we've seen those changes with several law enforcement agencies. So it does happen, and we're, we're ready to take action. Just tell us when. Okay, we're gonna have to uh, stop the questioning and close now. I wanted to run the Dodia clip one last time because I don't think it, it ran probably the last time. And in closing, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I want to let you know that on our website at ctip.defense.gov, uh, we plan to uh, post more information about this uh, conference that we had today, this event. Also on defense.gov, under their Explore page website, there will be uh, information about the CTIP program uh, supposed to come up today that sites should, should have. And it'll have videos and, and different events. And it'll have a timeline on DOD's CTIP program from the beginning to where we are today and what different things have occurred uh, during that time frame. So I'm going to try to run this video again. Um, 
We'll stick around if anyone has questions. We're, we're still going to stick around if anyone wants to come after we're done. I see this kid every day. Doesn't do his homework, can't stay awake in class. Last year, she was very shy. <coughs> Thank you all for coming.